Namaste and welcome everyone. It's so exciting to be here with you today. Today, Dr. David Frawley and I are going to be discussing the integration of the Vedic sciences of Jyotish and Ayurveda. I'm so excited to have you here today, Vamadeva. Namaste. Namaste. So before we get started on this exciting event, let's just open up with some mantras. Gananam twa ganapatim ha vamahe kavim kavinam upama shravastamam jai starajam brahmanam brahmanas patanaha srinbanu tibihi sida sadanam vakratunda mahakaya surya koti samaprabha ner vignam kurume deva Sarvakayeshu Sarvada Siddhi Bodhi Shakti Sahita Shriman Mahaganati Pataye Namo Namaha Nirvignam Kuru Om Yakundendu Tushara Hara Tavalaya Shurvava Sravrita Yavina Varadanda Mandi Takara Yasveda Padmasana Ya Brahma Chuta Shankara Prabhritir Vihir Devai Sada Vandita Saman Bhatu Saraswati Bhagavati Nishesha Jaja Paha Om Guru Brahman Guru Visnahor Guru Devo Maheswaraha Guru Sakshar Param Brahma Tasmai Sri Guru Vaina Maha Tasmai Sri Guru Vaina Maha Tasmai Sri Guru Vaina Maha Om Nilanjana Samaba Shamravi Putram Yamagrajam Chayamartanda Sambutam Tam Namami Shanai Sarayam Om Nilandana Samaba Samravi Putram Yamagrajam Chayamartanda Sambutam Tam Namami Shanai Sarayam Om Nilandana Samaba Shamravi Putram Yamagrajam Chayamartanda Sambutam Tam Namami Shanai Sarayam Om Pram Prim Pram Sahashanai 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 Sarayam Om Pram Prim Pram Om Sahasana Shraya Namaha Om Twameva Matacha Pitta Twameva Twameva Banducha Saka Twameva Twameva Vija Dravanam Twameva Twameva Sarvam Amriteshure Namaha Twameva Sarvam Amriteshure Namaha Twameva Sarvam Amriteshure Namaha Hari Om Om Namashivaya Namaste Om Sahana Babatu, Sahana Bunaktu, Sahabiryam Karavavahai, Tejas Vinavadita Mastu, Mavidvishavahai, Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha Hari Om. So we have a lot to discuss today, Vama Devaji. So let's get right into the goodness of it. So I have some questions that I've prepared for you and we'll have some you know, discussion outside of these questions, but we'll use them as a good basis to kind of go through our discussion today. So the first question that I have for you, sir, 
As a student of the Vedas and a practitioner of Vedic sciences, how deep historically over the centuries has Jyotish and Ayurveda related to each other in their practice and their approach? Okay, let me put this into some perspective. I have been studying the uh, and writing on the Vedas for more than 40 years, studying them for 50 years. I've gone through the Rig Veda and the original Sanskrit uh, many times. And I've also worked with yoga, Ayurveda, Vedanta, Jyotish, Vastu. And historically, I've also worked with the Indian Council of Historical Research and the Archaeological Survey of India on the ancient history issues relative to science, astronomy, astrology, medicine uh, through time. And so on that background, I've also looked at the historical text. There is, uh, of course, the historical texts like Charak and Shishrut and Ayurveda and Parashara, Wahara Mahira in uh, Jyotish, and also earlier pre uh, uh, Parashara Jyotish, as we have in the Vedas, and also uh, pre Charak uh, Ayurveda. So essentially, they've been connected from the beginning. As we say that the Ayurveda is the foremost of the Vedangas, I'm sorry, of the Upavedas or the secondary Vedic text, uh, because it deals with healing of body and mind, right living on all levels. And Jyotish is the foremost of the Vedangas or limbs of the Veda, because it is the eye of the Veda and it shows us the movement of time and how to deal with the subject of. Uh, karma. So they are inherently related at that level. And all the Vedic sciences have been used integrally in the traditions from ancient to modern times, again, including yoga, Vedanta, Ayurveda, Jyotish, and uh, Vastu. And they all are reflected upon uh, one another. The main issue is that in modern times, after India's independence, when the BAMS syllabus was introduced, a lot of these uh, other aspects were removed and Ayurveda was connected more with modern medicine. And so its connections with the older Vedic sciences was uh, kind of either lost or put in the background, even though many Ayurvedic practitioners continue to use them. Adiyom. Thank you um, for your elaboration and, 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 and it's very insightful. Um, now, as far as how they were historically and how they are now, would you say at all that there's a bit of a fragmentation um, with how you know they are today, kind of separate entities, uh, at least in some times of their modern day practice versus how they used to be uh, historically? Well, let me put a little more perspective on that. The British closed down the Ayurvedic schools in India. But at the same time, the British borrowed quite a lot of Ayurvedic medicine and Ayurvedic herbs for their own benefit. And however, did not give them the credit for uh, doing it. Then after, in, before India's independence, they started to bring back Ayurveda. My first and my main Ayurvedic teacher, Dr. Balavashta, was a graduate of the first Ayurvedic program in Maharashtra Sitara in 1941. So this was even before India's independence. And then after India's independence, they had to deal with medicine and how to deal with modern medicine and Ayurveda. So they created a joint uh, allopathic and Ayurveda syllabus. And because they were working at a national level with many different communities, they also then removed the connections with the more, es more esoteric things like uh, uh, Jyotish. And yoga also gained a separate kind of status of its own. And then they created the Ministry of Ayush, which is the Ministry of all the alternative or the traditional medicines. And that includes Ayurveda, uh, yoga, Tibetan medicine, Unani, Siddha, homeopathy. But of course, Jyotish was not included in that. So Jyotish is very popular and has continued, but outside those domains of medicine. And Ayurveda has been uh, uh, put under some, uh, I wouldn't say restriction, but it's been given a more identity as a physical medicine. Thank you. Thank you, Vamadeva. That's a perfect segue into my next question. 
which is looking from the perspective of the modern day allopathic model, how would you say that Ayurveda differs in its approach to medicine? Well, first I would like to explain how it's going on in India today. Uh, in India, you also have the modern medicine and you have a ministry of health and family welfare, as well as a ministry of Ayush. And I've also done some activities and talks on COVID with the ministry of health uh, and family welfare. And what they essentially say, uh, what, what the Indian view of allopathy then in Ayurveda is that they recommend Ayurveda more for lifestyle and chronic conditions, and they recommend the allopathy more for acute and surgical conditions, even though traditional Ayurveda had surgery. And this was the government statement relative to the COVID. Even though they recommended uh, the use of vaccination, they also recommended the use of Ayurvedic herbs and yoga practices and various Ayurvedic procedures to boost uh, Im immunity. Now, outside of India, of course, the modern allopathy would not accept Ayurveda at all. Uh, until recently, it's come into some aspects of the integrative medicine and is given a status like any other traditional system, herbal medicine, uh, Chinese medicine, uh, various uh, forms like that chiropractic. So it is given a place and now there's more research relative to its benefits in terms of lifestyle, behavioral medicine, uh, herbal medicine, yogic medicine. Of course, it's the basis of all yogic medicine. And so it is being brought in, but there is that gulf between uh, Ayurveda and the allopathic medicine. And that gulf is even more between allopathy and astrology, even though many prominent, many prominent allopathic doctors in India, like Dr. K.S. Charak, also do the uh, Jyotish. Definitely. And, you know, we can see that movement of integrative medicine kind of starting to develop, um, you know, here in Philadelphia, Jefferson Hospital has an integrative unit where they integrate Chinese herbalism as well as Ayurveda. Um, but comparatively the funding that they receive compared to some of the other departments of the hospital, it's, uh, it's so drastic. So, you know, there's definitely still a lot of uh, growth and evolution to be done in that area, but it's good that things are starting to, to at least move in that direction, right? Yes, in fact, a couple of years ago, we did a program on yoga and Ayurveda for the Harvard Medical School. And we found there was a lot of interest there. Uh, and of course, integration of some aspects of mantra and uh, meditation and openness at least to the practices, even though the theory is still in some levels difficult for them to understand. This is a big hypothetical, but fast forward 100, 200 years from now, where could you kind of see integrative medicine being here in the West? Well, I think we have to look at the issue of ecology, because unless we learn to live more in harmony with nature, unless we move away from being dominated by an artificial technology to uh, restoring our ecology, uh, we're going to have major problems uh, in the coming times. So Ayurveda as a medicine of nature aids us in this necessary integration and so for the future of humanity, it has to grow. And it's very essential that uh, we introduce this level of consciousness and prana into medicine that's united to the whole of nature and move out of just a mechanical drug uh, surgical model, which has its place, but doesn't address all the full integration of life that we need today. Yeah, 100%. It reminds me of when I was studying Dr. Vasant Lod. He would actually encourage the graduates of his program, go to medical school, get a graduate degree, become a practicing doctor, because it's those people with the knowledge of Ayurveda that then have the, the credentials of being a Western doctor that can really kind of bring some momentum to that movement, right? Right. And in India, of course, you have a fair amount of crossover of Ayurveda and the medicine there. 
And uh, you have, again, not only the knowledge, but again, even the, the modern medical doctors are often still very much grounded in their traditions. And in the United States, there's the American Association of Physicians of Indian Origin, who represent, I think, somewhere between 10 and 20% of the doctors in the United States. And many of them do have respect, not only for Ayurveda, but for all the Vedic sciences, yoga, and the traditions involved. So that group's also here. Beautiful. So let's bring a little bit of Jyotish into our conversation. And how would you say that Ayurveda and Jyotish treat the native differently? Is there some overlap in what is being treated and, 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 and what kind of distinctions can we make? We have to understand that traditionally each of these Vedic sciences had its own domain of expertise. They didn't, uh, they were working together, but they had their differences. Now, if we study Ayurveda, there are three levels of treatment. There's one called Yukti Vyapashraya or rational therapy. And to say simply, this is the physical medicine for reducing the doshas and the pathogens. It consists of diet and herbs, massage, Panchakarma, Rasayana. It also included surgery at a certain point. So this is the main Ayurveda that we ordinarily uh, see. Second level of Ayurveda was called Sattva Vijaya or increasing Sattva Guna. In Ayurvedic thought, Rajas and Tamas are the doshas or disease causing factors at the level of the mind. So the therapy of Sattva Vijaya is essentially yoga in terms of yoga sutras but also with certain Ayurvedic herbs and oils and practices uh, brought in. Its main practice is mantra and meditation are essentially all eight limbs of yoga and following a lifestyle or behavior pattern of the yamas and niyamas as we find in the yoga sutras. Another text used quite a lot in that context is the uh, uh, Bhagavad Gita. Uh, so the whole science of the mind was there. Then, at a third level, uh, what was called the Daiva or Divya Chikitsa, the subtle uh, celestial therapy uh, for dealing with karma, karma caused diseases and conditions. And that was specifically in Ayurveda, the realm of Jyotish, and because Jyotish helps us understand, uh, diagnose, and uh, see the results of karma. And certain karmic therapies like gems and rituals and various types of uh, pilgrimage, other things. Uh, there's a whole set of procedures for removing uh, these karmas. Uh, so doshas, gunas, and karmas, Ayurveda, yoga, and uh, jyotish all used together. And then uh, the Ayurveda has also used aspects of jyotish for the physical medicine uh, in terms of timing and uh, determination of constitution and I, aspects of Ayurveda, aspects of Jyotish in terms of the psychological medicine, because psychological factors are easier to see in the birth chart than are the physical factors involved. So what you need to understand is that Jyotish as the eye of the Vedas deals with all aspects of life, Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha, outer life, inner life, finances, work, relationship, physical and mental health spirituality. So it can come into any of these Vedic domains, at least at a secondary level. But wherever we are doing a healing application, we are more specifically in the domain of Ayurveda, and we need to understand the relative connections of those factors involved. Totally and completely. Um, so it this conversation reminds me of uh, a sutra uh, that I learned when I was studying with Dr. Vasantlad. I'm pretty sure it's Charak, but it might be Vagbat. But it goes something along the lines of Damarta Kama Mokshana, Marogya Mula Muttamam, Rogas Tashyaha Paraha, Shreya Sho, Jiva Tasha Cha. And maybe you can help me understand this, but the basic idea is that part of the purpose of Ayurveda is to give the body um, enough health and longevity so that it can achieve the Vedic four aims of life. 
Yes, that is the foundation of Ayurveda, to uh, deha shuddhi, purification of the body, and also uh, getting the ayu. Ayur means longevity on one level. But Ayurveda is also dis defined relative to the connection between right alignment of body, prana, senses, mind, and atman. So it's like setting the foundation, starting with the physical level for these uh, deeper connections and deeper aspects of Veda. And Ayur is ultimately Amrita, it's immortality. It's not just a question of physical health, but aligning us with the uh, inner immortality. Beautiful. And um, as far as Jyotis goes, um, would you say that it works more, now there's the medical approach too, but would you say Jyotis works more directly on the spiritual aspect of the karmas in terms of the vrittis and the samskara, um, working through some of those karmic challenges and patterns to kind of heal the soul to help it achieve its boreams of life. Um, you know, th that, well, I, yeah. I was just going to say, uh, Jyotis helps us understand what these karmas are and the timing of the karmas involved. Uh, in terms of measures of helping to deal with the karmas, making us conscious of the karma, and the Jyotish methods of rituals, mantras, and meditation relative to the planets and planetary deities uh, does help. But actually, the deeper, you might say, Vedanta, the deeper way of self-realization, you have to bring in the Vedanta uh, to do that. Jyotish in itself is not enough. Yoga and Vedanta must be brought in. And I've always told not only the Ayurvedic people, but the Jyotish people that you have to learn the Vedanta also, which is the relationship of the Jivatma, Paramatma, and this whole process of self-realization in order to address it. So Jyotish gives, the, gives us the background of karma, and it helps us remove subtle karmic obstacles, which is uh, what its remedies uh, do that may affect our health or our psychology or our outer life. And it also helps us understand, are we and when are we ready for what sadhanas? That is something Jyotish can help with. And that is why so many gurus uh, look at the Jyotish chart before giving practices. Hariyom. Hariyom. Yeah, you're really playing on my heartstrings there, Vamadeva, because I feel so deeply in my soul and my heart um, that the preservation of Jyotish as a, as a sadhana and the knowledge of the Vedas is so deeply integrated to it. And, you know, what I find as being a practicing professional Jyotish for many years is there's many astrologers that, that may let label themselves as, you know, Vedic astrologers or Jyotisha um, without any knowledge of Sanskrit, without any knowledge of the Paramatman, the Jivatman, um, Veda, various uh, ancient Vedic philosophies. And I just think this conversation we're having is so important for the, the preservation historically of what Jyotish is. Wonderful. I just want to tell you about uh, one of our main teachers about, in our lines. His name was Kavyakanta Ganapati Muni. He was the chief disciple of Bhagwan Ramana Maharshi. He gave him his name Ramana, and uh, he also helped him set up his teachings and ashram. And he was the greatest Sanskrit writer of modern India. He did a text called the Uma Sahasram, a thousand verses in praise of Uma, every chapter in a different Sanskrit meter. And he wrote on all aspects of Vedanta, Ayurveda, and Jyotish in specific uh, sutras and their integration. So we've also been trying to carry on uh, his teachings as well. So it's an integrative whole. And the problem we have in the West today is we get things in pieces. You get a little bit of yoga from over here. Uh, you get a little bit of Ayurveda from over there. I know that sometimes I was telling people I was doing a workshop on yoga and Ayurveda and they said, oh, you're doing a workshop on uh, cooking and herbs. <laughs> not understanding the details uh, involved. And so we pick up Jyotish a little bit. In fact, we pick up a technique here or there. Uh, we pick up a mantra here or there. 
and um, we use it in a certain way. And we have very mechanical minds. We want everything to be kind of black and white. We want to be able to look things up in a book. So this understanding of the whole system is very important, but it requires that we open our eyes. And many of the gurus who have brought these teachings to the West, uh, whether it was Maharishi, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi or Paramahansa Yogananda or uh, Swami Shivananda and his disciples, or even uh, in terms of Ayurveda, uh, teachers like uh, Dr. Ladd, uh, the integral part of this knowledge has been uh, uh, emphasized. And it's interesting to note in the India context, going to India 30 or 40 years ago, there was very little Ayurveda in the Indian ashrams. I think they were also looking, you know, feeling a bit, uh, uh, and you know, in doubt because of what the British had said. Today, every ashram in India has Ayurveda and Jyotish, whether it's uh, uh, Amrita Nandamai Ma or so many others. I could give you uh, a whole list. Hari Om. Hari Om. Thank you. So my next question for you, do you believe that as, and we briefly discussed this, but let's go into it in further detail. Do you believe that as practitioners of either Ayurveda or Jyotish, that as professionals, we have a responsibility to have a knowledge or integration of the other Vedic science, which may not be our area of expertise or formalized study? What level of obligation or responsibility do you think we have as a practitioner or focus on one of the sciences to kind of investigate and study the other as well? Not Maybe not just Ayurveda or Jyotish, but yoga, Vedanta as well. Well, first of all, if we do study one of them, we will find a lot of the other ones there. Take, for example, the uh, Charak uh, Samhita. He discusses yoga and some levels. And again, this is not the asana yoga. This is the yoga of yamas, niyamas, mantra, meditation. They also bring in the importance of bhakti uh, and yoga as self-knowledge. So, and then of course you learn the Sankhya system, which is the Vedic system of the 25 cosmic principles or tattva starting with purusha or paramatma, the uh, supreme self. So you get some flavor of that already. Even the Brihat Parashara Hora Shastra begins with the uh, devotional worship of Lord Vishnu. And again, uh, Bhakti Yoga. And Jyotish has all kinds of mantra, meditation, and rituals. So it is there already if you look at the uh, tradition. But certainly you must know because they form an integrative whole. For example, you cannot do any successful Ayurvedic lifestyle or counseling or a wellness recommendation without bringing in yoga, mantra, meditation, and without bringing in some idea of self-knowledge, uh, self-realization. So it's important that every student of any one of the Vedic sciences knows at least the fundamental principles of the others. So we say you should learn yoga in the broader sense, Raja Yoga, Hatha Yoga, Jnana, Karma, Bhakti, and also uh, the Ayurveda, and not only, uh, not only the physical Ayurveda, but the Ayurveda for uh, the mind. And then also Vedanta as the ultimate way of self-knowledge. And the Vastu Shastra is also part of this uh, field of uh, Jyotish or the Divya uh, Chikitsas. Now, of course, you can't necessarily learn all of them in detail, but you can at least learn the basics and know enough to make recommendations, okay, I see from your chart in terms of Jyotish that you may need some Ayurveda or you may need some uh, Vastu, or even from the standpoint of Ayurveda, you may need some Jyotish, you need some uh, Yoga Vedanta, all of that. So if you can't do it yourself, you can always interface with the community and connect people with other practitioners in the Vedic field. Arion, beautiful. I could not agree more. It, it reminds me of just an example of one of the things that Dr. Vasant Lad, when I was studying with him, you know, one thing that 
if you didn't necessarily have the knowledge of Jotish that, you know, it, you, when you're always trying to kind of save someone's life. Um, but if your understanding of Jotish, Dr. Basant Lad, he would look at a chart and he would see that, you know, inevitably um, in a given case that maybe the karma was fixed on some level um, and that it was inevitable that this person would be um, transcending their, their physical body. And at that point, it goes to shamana, right? The palliative therapy to make that kind of exit um, as beautiful and peaceful as possible instead of trying to keep them within the physical body when maybe the fixed karma for them to be leaving the body was, um, was imminent. Well, that's a very important point. The astrologer should never interfere with the karma of the person they are giving the reading to. And the astrologer should never take over karmic responsibility for the other person's life by making decisions for them. The astrologer is there to give useful information and wisdom, but each individual is karmically responsible and must be left to make their own choices. And if astrologer gets involved in the karmas of other people, it generally affects them adversely in terms of their ability to give readings or even in terms of karmic complications in their own lives. So this assuming of karmic responsibility and asking everyone to assume that, that your client should have a take karmic responsibility for their lives is foundational for the Vedic knowledge. Hari Om. Hari Om. Uh, absolutely essential and beautiful to bring that to the surface. So just a little bit elaboration on something we briefly mentioned. How is the Sankhya philosophy and maybe some other Vedic philosophies interwoven into the Vedic sciences? Well, first of all, you have to understand that Sankhya is a Vedantic or Vedic tradition. It has 25 uh, principles, 25 prime cosmic principles. And we find these principles presented in the Bhagavad Gita. Upanishads, uh, there's an interesting Upanishads called Prashna, which actually has 40 or 43 principles because it adds sense organs, uh, sense objects, motor organs, mo and so on. So it's a way of delineating cosmic principles. It's the most primary system used, but we also have related systems of the pancha koshas and the five or the five koshas or the three bodies or various other enumerations of cosmic principles such as we find in Advaita Vedanta. And in the tantric system, they add 11 subtle principles beyond the 25 to have 36, with the 25th being the Jivatma, not the Supreme Purusha, and the 36th being Parashiva, the Supreme Reality, and other cosmic principles in between. So it's a very important system for delineating one, the principles of cosmic reality, but these are also reflected in the human being. Uh, for example, the principles of the physical body, the five elements, the principles of the Linga Sharira, or the subtle body make up most of the uh, Sankhya principles. And then of course the Purusha Atma as the supreme self or the individual self at least beyond or behind all the uh, tattvas. So Sankhya and its variations and its related principles are there in all the systems and also interwoven with different related uh, philosophies. And these are also there in the uh, Jyotish, and they even color the Jyotish. So, for example, um, the uh, uh, Brihad Parashara Hora Shastra is a more of a Vaishnava uh, text, but you also have Shaivite text on uh, Jyotish. Ayurveda, in terms of the uh, uh, basic system with Danwantri, who is an avatar of Vishnu is more of a Vaishnava approach. But we've also studied the Shaivite uh, Ayurvedic tradition from the uh, Himalayas, for example, Panak Nanak Chan Sharma. And in the Rig Veda, the oldest Vedic text, the most, the supreme doctor is Rudra Shiva or Rudra Soma. 
So these things are all interwoven uh, philosophically. And then of course, you can look up at the Atma Purusha as Brahma, Vishnu, uh, Shiva. But mainly for Sankhya, you have to understand the principles of the universe and that the universe is a conscious being. It is not just a conglomeration of material forces. Universe is the cosmic person, uh, the Purusha, and the sense organs, motor organs are there throughout the universe. You know, even animals have them, but there are also powers of seeing and hearing at subtle levels, causal levels. Uh, there are devatas and forces throughout the universe. For example, in Upanishads, speaking of Purusha as the supreme reality, they say, yo sao aditye Purusha so hamas me, the Purusha in the sun. But there the sun is a symbol of Paramatma. It's not simply the outer sun, but understanding the universe as a manifestation of consciousness as one being and all the other beings as different functions or manifestations of the Supreme Purusha. And as the goal of the human being to manifest the cosmic Purusha by developing a higher consciousness. We're not very good at it at this point, mm -hmm. future human evolution we may be, but is that interface of the macrocosm, microcosm, you know, cosmic Purusha, individual self that is there. So all of these systems are very important. Hariyom. Hariyom, lovely. It's, it's such a beautiful description there. And one of the ways that I've heard it described that, that really resonated for me, I think it was Dr. Vasant Lad who presented this translation for Sankhya, the descent of consciousness into matter. And I also like um, maybe just a funny little way, pejorative motto of, of what we say here in the West sometimes, as above, so is below. So the next question that I have for you, Dr. Wonderful. And Kapila Muni, the founder, oops, just one question. Uh, Kapila Muni, the founder of the Sankhya system, uh, was also uh, very closely connected to the Hiranya Garba, the founder of the uh, yoga uh, tradition. And also Lord Krishna very much uh, followed uh, the teachings. You'll find a lot of the Sankhya in the Bhagavad Gita. So bringing more of the integration uh, into our discussion a little bit more. So from the perspective of, let's say, being a professional Ayurvedic doctor or practitioner of some kind, even an Ayurvedic lifestyle consultant, uh, what do you think is the best way to integrate Jyotish into the practice of that? Yes. Yeah, it's a very important consideration, how to integrate Jyotish into your Ayurvedic uh, practice. Ayurveda, of course, has applications on various levels. Any individual uh, can adapt as self-healing the main principles and lifestyle of Ayurveda to uh, great uh, benefit. Then you have specific Ayurvedic therapies, nutrition therapy, uh, herbal therapy, various types of massage uh, therapy. And then you also have the broader therapies, Panchakarma, Rasayana. So there's quite a bit of different approaches there. And then uh, you also have uh, a certain expertise involved in those. So first of all, the uh, Ayurvedic practitioner should learn the basics of Jyotish, at least, you know, planet signs, houses, Dashas know what they're for. And then they have a certain choice they can make. One, they can go more deeply into the study of Jyotish themselves so they can apply it on their own, or they can develop a relationship with the Jyotishi to help them do that, where they would then uh, work with the client that way. Now, for that purpose, of course, you need to have the birth data of the client, and you also have to have the approval of the uh, client to use and study uh, their uh, birth data. And then what you can do is you begin compiling the charts of your patients and learn to see the relationship. 
And there are certain simple things you can do. For example, even understanding dashas, buktis, transits can at least help you see what is the progression going on involved. Even if you can't diagnose the condition uh, completely, if you can at least note the timing and then you can find out or have some other jyotishi come in there and say, well, what is the, what are these influences for the future? Do they promote getting better or they do, do they promote uh, uh, getting worse? And ultimately, uh, particularly after studying a lot of charts of people, uh, you can uh, begin to uh, make diagnosis on your own. You can also see the doshic types. You know, dosha is very simple because they reflect the planets. You know, sun, Mars, Ketu, fiery, pitta planets, you know, moon, uh, Jupiter, Venus, watery, cuff of planets, uh, Saturn, Mercury, Rahu, Airy, Wata Dosha, planets. There's other variations. It's a little more complicated than that. But there's a lot of crossover. And both systems use the Pancha Mahabhutas, the five elements, ascertainment of prana, and then learning to know the basics of uh, Jyotish, the first house and the body, and the physical life, sixth house and disease, eighth house death. 12th house hospitalization. And then I always tell the Ayurvedic people and the Jyotishis, if you're studying medical astrology, you also need to study the charts of healthy people. If you only look at the charts of sick people, you are going to find sickness everywhere. So look at good athletes, look at people who are healthy, look at people who, are longe who have good longevity so you can see the factors involved. So I've worked with a number of Ayurvedic uh, practitioners in helping them bring Jyotish into their uh, practice. And uh, that is uh, what we do. The other thing I say, tell them to do is you have to learn more than just the medical uh, Jyotish. Why? Because you need to cross-reference, you know. Uh, certain charts may be good for being a doctor. Certain charts may be good or bad for relationship. If you can cross-reference other domains of life, when you're looking at health, then you're more likely to be accurate than if you don't see the other potentials uh, in the chart. So tremendous potential is there, but at least know the basics and have a good connection with a uh, Jyotishi and work with a Jyotishi and learning medical astrology. But that Jyot medical Jyotishi should also know Ayurveda and have some ground of communication. Adiyom. Adiyom, that is such amazing advice for practicing Ayurvedic professionals. Um, now let's look at it from the other side of the coin, from the other perspective, from the perspective of being, let's say, a professional Jyotisha, uh, a daily practicing Jyotisha who's doing, you know, consultations, you know, consistently. What do you think is the best way to integrate Ayurveda? Well, again, we have to understand that Jyotish covers many fields. So it's a little more challenging for the Jyotishi to figure out which aspects of the chart are relating to health, healing, and medicine, because they can also specialize in relationship astrology, financial astrology, uh, career, or even uh, spirituality. So they, first of all, need to know which aspects of the chart have connections there. Uh, but one thing we always say, as I told you earlier, uh, Jyotish can address Dharma, Arta, Kama, Moksha. But Jyotish, the first thing that Jyotishi has to do is to see the physical and mental well-being of the client. I remember talking with uh, Gayatri Vasudev, Dr. Dr. Raman's daughter, about uh, relationship astrology. So she said, before you go into all these subtle calculations, make sure that the persons or person or persons involved are physically and psychologically fit. You know, if they have major physical or psychological problems, there's no need to go off and do a relationship compatibility or uh, whatever. So that is where the Jyotishi uh, needs to study the basics of Ayurveda, for example, how the planets and the doshas connect and psychology. Jyotish is the best thing for psychology because it's easy to see what's happening with the moon, Mercury, Jupiter, Buddhi in the fifth house, Manas in the fourth house, 
uh, ego in the first house. There's, we have so many good rules of that in dashas, transits, places of Rahu Ketu. So the psychological nature is easy uh, to see. And then, uh, of course, the Jyotishi, you have two things. One, the basic health potential of the person at birth. And two, when uh, diseases may be likely to develop over the course of time. For example, if the birth chart is weak, disease can manifest in the dasha or bukti of the ascendant Lord, the Lord of the chart. Uh, so even if you don't know the details of Ayurveda, uh, you can know something of medical astrology. And then here we have an interesting phenomenon. Uh, Jyotish helps us understand the different parts of the body. So locating a disease relative to parts or functions can also be seen uh, relative to uh, Jyotish, even if you don't know Ayurveda. I'll give you a simple example. Here is a chart that's a Leo ascendant, Jupiter's rising in Leo, but the sun is in the eighth house in Pisces ruled by uh, Jupiter. You have an exchange between the first and the eighth Lords, and that is a yoga for heart disease. You would think, oh, Jupiter rising, and Leo the person should do very well. No, it's a, it's a yoga for heart disease. It's not necessarily going to tell you to what extent it's Vata, Pitta, or Kapha, usually more Kapha is involved, but sometimes Pitta there, but it is going to give you that type of information. The other thing we have to bear in mind relative to the Jyotish is the Jyotish chart not only shows you disease, it also shows you injury. And so determining what is the disease and what is an injury is not always easy because the sixth house uh, rules over uh, both. So again, an alliance of the Jyotishi and uh, an Ayurvedic practitioner and an understanding of the basics of Jyotish and medical astrology. Uh, Dr. Charak, my friend, who's also a surgeon and medical doctor, has very good books on medical astrology that way, but he doesn't cross over the Ayurveda too much. I sometimes joke with him, your name is Charak and you're not doing so much of the Ayurvedic uh, uh, aspect, but he recognizes its value. But my point is here that you can see parts of the body, organs dysfunction, then dashas, dashas of different lords, sixth lord, eighth lord, twelfth lord, marika planets. So there are things about health and longevity that Jyotishi can bring in without knowing Ayurveda, but they should at least know the basics of Ayurveda. Adiyam. Thank you so much. That is so helpful from both sides of the court from the professional Jyotish and the professional Ayurveda integration. Now, um, maybe we'll get into a little bit of some practical examples um, with these next uh, few questions, just a few more questions, Vamadeva. How can the concept of both treatment in Ayurveda and remedies in Jyotish be duly applied for the most holistic approach to healing? So in other words, um, yes on either side of the fence, what are some examples of uh, integration of Ayurveda and Jyotish in, in a remedy? Yes. Well, first of all, we have to understand that in terms of physical diseases in the domain of Ayurveda, primarily. Uh, psychological disease, Ayurveda and uh, yoga. So here, the Jyotish contribution is going to be more secondary in a way. Chitram Chikitsa or therapy is there in Ayurveda. And I wanna mention this briefly because we have people who talk about yoga therapy or yoga Chikitsa. There is no history in India of any yoga therapy or yoga Chikitsa without Ayurveda, not based upon Ayurveda. Chikitsa is there in all the, yogic te in all the Ayurvedic texts not in the uh, yoga texts. Yoga texts are for moksha and for chitta shuddhi, uh, deha shuddhi, purifying body and mind, which is uh, very uh, helpful and also for uh, treating uh, the mind. What Jyotish has are upayas. Upayas are aids and they aid in our karmas. And some of them can be directed towards physical health or psychological health. Uh, some of them can be directed toward other domains of life, career, relationship, uh, spirituality. 
Uh, so we have to then see those. And jo the Jyotish mainly uses things like uh, gems, uh, mantras, uh, rituals, propitiating the planets, uh, all of that. Uh, and then we have to recognize that whenever there is a therapy recommended, there has to be a diagnosis, right? So Ayurveda has a diagnosis or nidana that leads to a chikitsa or a uh, therapy. Uh, Jyotish is looking at the chart as a whole, so it's going to look at the whole of life. So then it needs to uh, bring out what are the issues or factors that relate to health physically and uh, mentally, and then look at the planets, nakshatras, signs involved, dashas, buktis, uh, transits, and then recommend either the Jyotish Upayas, you know, the, uh, uh, whether it is the uh, rituals, the mantras, the gems, or Jyotish can also rec uh, recommend the physical Upayas. If it's a certain affliction to the physical, to physical body, Jyotish would also recommend Ayurveda or modern medicine. Uh, Dr. Ramon used to always say that Ayurveda is also, can also be looked upon as an upaya for uh, Jyotish. But in that regard, the Ayurvedic practitioner would, de would uh, determine the details involved because Ayurveda addresses the medicine at a daily level of changes and at the physical factors. Jyotish will look at the condition relative to long-term influences over the years, or over transit, dashas, buktis. So it's not so effective for changing your medication today, but it gives you long-term uh, life-supporting uh, remedies uh, at a subtle level. Haryom. Beautiful, I love that, Vamadeva. So along those same lines, kind of just taking off of the last question, there are many therapies and remedies that overlap. There can be some overlap there in Ayurveda and Jyotish. Um, the most well-known being gem therapy. Um, are there other therapies that you would say overlap the way that gem therapy does? And then also, if you could discuss, how, do you, how does gem therapy exactly work on an energetic, medical, and karmic level from your perspective? Okay, well, I'm going to turn that into two questions. Cool. Uh, the second one, how gem therapy works. And the first one, the overlap of remedies. Now, of course, if somebody knows Ayurveda and Jyotish together, they can recommend Ayurvedic therapies after looking at the birth chart, whether it's certain herbs or they say you need a purification of this organ or that organ. That is based upon knowing uh, both the systems uh, together. Now, so Ayurveda has its specific realm. Now there are certain areas. One of course is the psychological therapies, which include the behavioral therapies, uh, mantra, meditation. Uh, Jyotish will also often recommend mantras. In fact, in that regard, it's more common for the Jyotishis to recommend mantras than it is for the Ayurvedic people to do so. Although both can do them to some degree. And here, there's also an overlap between Jyotish and yoga. For example, connecting planetary deities also with their uh, transcendent uh, uh, deities, not just simply towards, you know, uh, Surya, you can also worship Surya and Orion. You know, it's the Vaishnava uh, tradition. You can bring in that aspect of bhakti yoga as an upaya. And the spiritual type of upayas like mantras they can work also work on all levels of life, although they're not a substitute. For example, doing mantras to the deity you worship doesn't mean you don't take any medicines, but it can still support your physical and particularly uh, psychological health. So getting then to the specific question of gems, gems or money, M-A-N-I, uh, the basis of the main Jyotish therapies and also this uh, Divya Chikitsa of Ayurveda. And here, of course, gems are, it's not just limited to gems. Under the concept of money or gem also includes mantras, yantras, uh, rudrakshas, various uh, subtle remedial measures connected to rituals, uh, murti puja, uh, temple worship, 
uh, pilgrimage, uh, and even uh, behavioral changes uh, in your uh, life. But uh, the gems have become the most significant. And gems, uh, one great uh, yogi, um, uh, Swami Yogeshwarananda, he said that the gems hold the subtle sattva guna energy of the earth element. So they are able to transmit the energy of the sattva guna from the higher levels of existence through the physical matter, and then also use that to impact the physical body, but not only the physical body, but also the uh, subtle body as well. So the gems have their different energetic principles, and also gems are, can be used for dharma, arta, kama, moksha, not just simply for the arogya or for the health issues. So people will do certain mantras or certain gems or rituals to find a good marriage partner or to uh, have good children, that sort of thing. So the Ayurvedic application of the gem therapy is a little more uh, specific. And what I recommend there is recommending gems. There are certain gems that are good for the whole life and well being of a person. Often, for example, the gem of the Lord of the Ascendant, uh, if it is afflicted. So there is a more specific gem application relative to uh, Ayurveda. If a disease occurs, uh, we also have to see the planets uh, involved. And the rule that I usually follow is to wear a gem that strengthens the weaknesses that you may have in terms of health or longevity. The planet that is causing the weaknesses, say Mars, Saturn, whatever, it's also good to propitiate them through mantras and rituals, but it's not always safe to wear their gemstones because they can have an inimical uh, influence. So there's a whole, you might say, set of considerations about the uh, gem uh, therapy. And the other point uh, we have to always remember is the gem is an instrument. You have to purify and energize it properly. And you have to have the proper intent or sankalpa in using it. You know, you have the system of Tantra and you can use uh, gems, mantras, other things for various goals of life, including those defined by rajas or tamas. If you're just, I want a gem that's going to make me powerful and wealthy and dominate other people. Or, you know, I want a gem that's going to help me destroy my enemies. Those are rajasic, tamasic usages. They may have some effect, but they're going to bring more rajas and tamas in your own life. They're going to pollute your own karma. So be very careful. Uh, with that. So there needs to be a sattvic sankalpa uh, on the person that is using the gems. And I mention that uh, because uh, some people think that a gem will el eliminate bad karma for you. And I just have to tell you, it is not true. You have to face your own karma. Don't think you can uh, perpetuate Saturn or Shani Dev by putting in a nice expensive blue sapphire for yourself and thinking now Shani is going to do what I want him uh, to do. Highly disrespectful and of course uh, naive. So one has to have some aspect of bhakti and as we say, karmic responsibility. And essentially you're saying this, you know, like with Shani, I'm wearing this gem to honor uh, the karmic energies that are ruled over by you in the universe. Uh, please be kind to me, but please also do what you think is best. And uh, uh, I respect you. And then if you're honoring Shani, you also have to have a lifestyle that goes along with it. You have to develop some uh, humility, uh, respect for other creatures, uh, self-discipline, uh, some degree of austerity. The gem needs to be uh, supported by a lifestyle and a state of mind. You can't just put on a lot of gems and think that now I'm beyond karma or now I will get... Uh, what I want, we need to use it as an instrument of worship, 
not just simply as a way of uh, doing better uh, for ourselves. And it's good to combine the gem with mantra, meditation. Sometimes you can even put the gem on the uh, mala. But again, be respective. Aryam. Aryam, I, I love this conversation. So um, you mean I can't just pay off my karmic debt by buying gems? That's so unfortunate. Um, no, I'm just making a little joke. But I've always been a really big believer uh, in gem therapy. And from different schools of Jyotish, there's just a lot of different opinion about how to properly utilize it. And I love bringing that sattvic energy into it to, to really utilize it in the best way. Um, you know, in my personal experience of, you know, um, being ruled by Saturn and, and going through my Saturn Dasha um, and, and the intention that you bring to the gem, um, my, my sapphire representing, you know, my choice and path of sobriety, for example, um, has been uh, that discipline that I've created to not interact with mind altering substances. Um, it's, it's part of that discipline that has really made that gem um, remedial for me because it's, it's symbolic of this path of sobriety that I've chosen, for example. Now, I'm just curious um, for your thoughts on maybe some examples of gem therapy gone wrong in your experience, maybe some malefic or negative effects of, of gem therapies. And, and is there a way to maybe remedy that with the intention? Uh, just curious your thoughts. Okay, uh, I want to put this in a broader context. First of all, gems are not necessary for every chart. Generally, if you have a major benefic like the Lugna Lord, Ninth Lord, or Fifth Lord that is weak, uh, gem therapy can be helpful. But say somebody has an Aries ascendant, uh, a Virgo moon, uh, a Pisces sun, there's a lot of different interrelationships between planetary energies there or different combinations. So we wouldn't recommend gems for everybody. It's generally if one particular planet can be strengthened as a lifetime purpose, or we may recommend a gem for short term during a specific transit. Say for example, uh, the moon. The moon is a malefic Lord in your chart. It rules the eighth house or something. But during a transit of the moon uh, of Saturn or Mars, then you may want to wear a gem for the moon anyway. And then also some differences. For example, we more likely give gems for feminine planets like the moon for women. And it's not always the case. So there are variations in the gems that we give. And we have to determine if it's how, the duration we're giving the gem for. So some are just a specific thing. For example, uh, uh, say someone's having trouble with their work, okay? Then you may want to give the gem for the 10th Lord but the 10th Lord isn't always good for the chart as a whole. It may have other influences. So you just wear that uh, temporarily with a specific uh, intention and time limit involved. So that's more of a strategic one. Then you have a funny situation in which a person uh, uh, is wearing a gem of a planet that is already strong. And uh, the simplest example is, of course, the crowns of kings. <laughs> the idea there was they needed rubies because their job was so stressful that even though they had a strong sun, they could always need more solar energy to uh, rule the uh, country. So in other words, there are various considerations to be brought into play. And also combination of gems. For example, if you're wearing a gem for Shani, Saturn's a natural malefic. But if you combine it with a smaller gem uh, faceted there or a smaller gemstone of Venus, then that Venus is a friend of Shani, but will also soften or mitigate against the negative potentials of Shani as a natural malefic. So gem combinations are there. And of course, some people wear the Navaratna, which has all the nine gems. And it's a good general thing to do. But still, if you have a specific problem with the, based on one planet, it's always best to have a gem for that specific planet. Now we have an additional factor is where did the gem come from? Mm -hmm. how, is it, how is it made? That's one reason you need purification. 
and its quality. But I, I go against some astrologers here. I say that if you, even if you have a secondary gemstone, if you can afford an expensive gemstone, but you use it with devotion, it may, it's going to help you quite a bit. You don't have to have the best quality ruby, the best quality emerald, uh, your stone may be heat treated, all of these things. So you need to work with a, uh, a gemologist also, but it's not just the mechanical matter of wearing the gem. Secondary gemstones can be used or other upayas like certain rudrakshas or different types of malas. They can be actually more effective than uh, gemstones. So we need to bring these different factors into play. Then the second part of your question of uh, times in which uh, gemstones were pro probably uh, prescribed wrong. Uh, I'm not going to mention the person involved, but I do know a time when someone showed me a chart and they had Saturn in the 10th house uh, and uh, very strong position. And they felt that the Saturn Dasha, they would recommend a uh, gemstone for Saturn for the, because the person had some position and wanted more. Unfortunately, a few months later, they were in a horrible car crash truck ran into the car that they were uh, driving. Uh, so there are issues, and particularly with malefic gemstones, like gemstones for Saturn, and even rubies. Rubies very careful if there's hypertension and uh, pitta uh, conditions. And I have a good source for the gemstone. And again, purify it uh, properly and do regular mantras for the gem. Sometimes I tell people, you know, the gemstone is sort of like, you know, you had a radio, you have to set the jet, you have to set the radio to a certain channel, just having a radio and turning it on and letting it blare from any place it has to be may not help you. You have to attune it properly. And then gems hold subtle energies. Say a gemstone, uh, you buy a gemstone or you may not know the gemstone was married by, was uh, used by someone who was an unhealth, unhappy person. Uh, so be careful with that and energize the gems around temples with mantras. There's certain practices that can be done because they can absorb subtle energies in the uh, environment and don't energize them with your negative emotions. They will hold those. And again, have a great deal of uh, self-discipline. And I have seen, uh, uh, I do recall there was one, uh, one person who also put on a yellow sapphire for Jupiter, uh, which was uh, very good, and it didn't have good results. Uh, and I said, what was going on? So I went back to, to the person who gave the gem, and I will say it was in India, and they admitted that uh, the gemstone had not, been, had not undergone all the proper procedures, and it was previously given to another person who had problems and gave it back. Uh, so there's a certain responsibility to either the gemologist or the jyotishi uh, when they recommend the gem also to recommend these procedures for purifying uh, the gem or preliminary wearing of it or taking it to a temple. And of course, they, which finger to wear the gems on is, I also say I like to use them also as the uh, meru bead on the uh, mala and uh, that way, whenever you're doing your mantras, you're also energizing that particular stone as well. So I would compare it with herbs. Herbs are great, but you can't just give any herbs to anybody. You have to have the proper diagnosis and uh, treatment and also supportive lifestyle. If you give person a, uh, uh, the best herbs, but they don't change their diet, they're eating all the bad food, the herbs are not going to work. So the gems also need the lifestyle therapy and the sadhana to go with them, uh, particularly, of course, uh, Shani. That's why in India, you also have these uh, Navagraha temples or uh, Shani temples where you can have the propitiation uh, done there. There's a very nice Shani temple in the south of Delhi. And uh, they also do these practices where you uh, anoint the body, your own body with oil, uh, after doing the circumnambulation of the uh, 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 Navagraha Murtis. We have in one of our temple rooms, the Navagraha 
murtis that we got from Ujjain. Ujjain is the where you have the Mahakal, the great uh, Shiva Linga of the Lord of Time. And it's the astrological center of India in terms of prime meridian. So we got some special murtis of the planets from there. And so many of the temples also have those. And even if you honor or need to honor one planet primarily, it's good to do some mantras for all the planets along with your other uh, sadhanas and practices. So you need someone who has some knowledge of the whole application of the uh, gems and will give you the right attitudes and factors involved and may even tell you, you may not need a gem. You know, your chart shows that uh, uh, the combination of planets doesn't reveal one planet in particular that needs to be strengthened. So there may be a certain deity that you need to look into uh, and uh, so forth. And of course, there are also gems for the mind besides gems for the body. These are very important uh, as well, particularly today when our biggest problem now is psychological unrest, even for Ayurvedic practitioners that they're mainly dealing with people of anxiety, depression, anger, all of that. And Jyotish is very helpful there. And Jyotish is, I say, the one, I would say Jyotish is the best tool of psychology in terms of diagnosis uh, and recommendations for uh, treatment. Because just talking to a person, you cannot see their psychology so well. It may be hidden. But the Jyotish chart, you know, fourth house is Manas, fifth house is Buddhi, moon overall, Mercury. Moon, Mercury opposite, you will have disturbances of the uh, mind. If Saturn has, if Saturn has joint Mars, Saturn, I'm sorry, if the moon has both joint Mars and Saturn aspects on it, it's okay, it's better for spirituality, but domestic happiness is often difficult in that type of chart, with some exceptions relative to uh, 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 certain positions. And even issues like relationship happiness, you can also see that more easy in the chart. For example, certain planets are uh, in the 10th house, even in fact, most, I mean, in, in the seventh house of relationship. In fact, very few planets do well in the seventh house, but uh, uh, Sun, Saturn, Mars, but they can be very good for the career, even if they're not so good for uh, the relationship. So there are uh, ways that astrology can help you balance your goals and what you're seeking and help you gain uh, happiness. And of course, fourth house is the emotional nature, mother, all these things. So there's so much you can see about the psychology there. And then you can have recommendations of mantra, meditation, rituals, or even uh, certain Ayurvedic herbs. You know, you have all these uh, ashwagandha, uh, brahmi, you have so many uh, shankapushpi, uh, simple herbs for the mind that you can also uh, recommend Ariyam. Ariyam, that was lovely diving into that ocean with you, Mama Deva. Just a couple concluding questions um, to kind of, you know, end this on an exciting uh, and high note. One uh, question um, that I would like to ask you, and I don't mean to there's a little bit of maybe uh, energy that I put into this question. So I apologize if anyone is, uh, feels any way about this. As we move into modern era of both Ayurveda and Jyotish, where every other person and their mother may consider themselves a practitioner, how can we maintain the integrity of the Vedas and the qualities encouraged to carry these sciences? In other words, what are the qualifications in your perspective to be a professional Jyotish or Ayurvedic practitioner? Yes, well, there's two levels here. There are one, what you could say are ethical or spiritual uh, qualifications. And then you can say second are the more specific understanding of the technicalities of Ayurveda and Vedic astrology. Now, uh, both have a lot of uh, karmic responsibility. Jojish, you're giving karmic recommendations. Ayurveda, you're dealing with lifestyle and health. Well, one of my recommendations, if you're recommending Ayurveda, you should first of all follow an Ayurvedic life yourself. Uh, 
and you should understand the basic principles of right living. Ayurveda is not a system of disease treatment. Ayurveda is a system of right living. Disease treatment is the secondary. I sometimes tell people, uh, modern medicine is sort of like the fireman. They can help you uh, put out the, the fire if your house is burning. Ayurveda teaches you how to build a house that's fireproof. Uh, that is more its concern. So you have to live an Ayurvedic lifestyle, but that includes not just physically right living in terms of diet and exercise and related factors. It's also ethically right living. Yamas and niyamas are also there for Ayurvedic practitioners and also there for Jyotish uh, practitioners. And that also means uh, right use of finances. It's important that Ayurvedic and practitioners and Jyotishis have the same respect of any professional practitioner in those fields, but they need to use their finances uh, properly. And uh, they also need a sadhana, some daily practice they're doing. It doesn't have to be specifically Jyotish or Ayurveda, it may include aspects of those, whatever particular guru or deity or Shastra or what we say Sampradaya uh, to follow, uh, you should have that. And your practice is there for self-realization. Helping others is part of it, uh, but it is not done as a way of just simply money or social status. In fact, uh, uh, in the Ayurveda uh, and the Jyotish uh, uh, overall, you have to, of course, represent the teachings and the traditions uh, involved. You have to continue to study and understand and modify uh, what you do. For example, uh, I always talk about the, your track record in Ayurveda or in uh, Jyotish. You read in a book that uh, this particular combination is very bad for this type of health condition. My question to you is then this, and how many charts have you seen this combination and verified that it is actually harmful? Because there's so many mitigating factors that can come up. Keep your track record and don't just simply, if, if you see a combination that says traditionally this causes this type of problems, you can say so, uh, but you have to address what is going on. I'll give you an example. This is not problems, but I remember doing a lot of readings in Europe. I used to go there quite a lot. And I noticed that the combinations for women that would give children weren't working. And then I realized it was because they're in a culture in which uh, having children was no longer a priority. And jobs, are you going to say that uh, your chart indicates that you should be a charioteer or you should be a doctor based upon this? We have a totally different set of jobs uh, today. Relationships, you know, in, in traditional times, you had a marriage for life. Now you can, you can change marriage every dasha or they have a relationship, but they don't get married. Or in Europe, they have a child, but they don't get married. I mean, we have these different things going on. So we have to continually update uh, the uh, understanding of uh, Jyotish. For example, a lot of the mass media relates to Rahu, including pandemics, epidemics. You know, uh, I've done a lot of study of the pandemic we had that way, but it also relates to mass media uh, and social influence, Maya, all of that. So we have a new set of Rahu influences now. Ketu, besides astrology, also relates to mathematics and even research and uh, technology. Uh, so we need to update our system relative to the society we are living in now. Uh, even we have the issue in Ayurveda, we recommend uh, for people to take a certain herb, but in what form? Uh, how, how old is the herb? Is it a powder? In Ayurveda, we have special uh, formulations. You have these Chavan Prash, or you have uh, Brahma Rasayana, uh, you have uh, Ashwagandha Layam, you have all the special Tylas or oils. So it's very important to give the medicine in the right form that also has the potency uh, preserved. You can't just say, oh, tell a person you should take this a particular herb or a therapy. And then 
the point that I want to bring out is this is a kind of going beyond this, but connected to it. This one reading model of Jyotish does not work. Just like going to your doctor once, going to an Ayurvedic doctor once doesn't work. You need to have an ongoing relationship with the Ayurvedic practitioner or the Jyotishi and study of your own chart or your own uh, health because factors keep changing. Uh, so, and also you can't tell everything in one chart. I often tell people that your birth chart is like the map of your entire life. And you want me to tell you which street to turn on tomorrow to get to a particular place you want to go. Uh, you have to look at dashas, buktis, transits, annual charts. You have to cross-reference from the individual's experience. Okay, if Rahu has this affliction, what happened during your last Rahu Bhukti or uh, Dasha or Rahu transit? Uh, you have to verify things in the chart. Diagnose that doesn't end with a magical pulse diagnose. There are very few who can do that. That's one thing you look into, but you have to then educate the client. And then of course you have specializations. Uh, if someone wants a health reading, that should be separate from a general life reading, although there can be some crossover. If someone wants upayas, that should be a separate reading than uh, just the general overall uh, reading of the uh, chart. Uh, there needs to be a regular interchange because communication is very difficult. And you, as we know from the human mind, mainly people do not tell the truth. Human mind is not designed to tell the truth. It's to tell you what you want to hear or what sounds best for the person saying it. So we have to develop a level of communication uh, over time. And then things have to be verified in the person's own experience. If you recommend an Ayurvedic uh, formula, then they're going to take it for a while uh, before they're gonna say, yes, that works uh, for me. So too with gems or mantras and then we live in a world where there's so many influences. So you need a reinforcement of behavior. So you can't just tell somebody, oh, lead a sattvic lifestyle and they'll do it. Uh, you have to have some regular dialogue communication with them. So in our system, we recommend the counseling model of Ayurveda and uh, Jyotish, particularly over the predictive model. Oh, you look at the chart and say, next year, you're gonna have this problem. Okay, very good. But what the person really needs is guidance as to how to live their life according to the karmic indications uh, in the chart and their dominant planets. A Mars type person may not know that. They think it's good to be you know, angry and harsh and assertive that that's what you need to do. Uh, so self-knowledge is also there. All the Vedic sciences are ways of self-knowledge. If you get a disease, you have to understand why you got it. And most physical diseases have psychological counterparts first. Heart disease, there'll be some emotional issue uh, behind that that's been building up. So the ability of the Jyotishi or the Ayurvedic doctor to communicate and to maintain a relationship with the client that includes therapies and upayas, but that also just includes among the therapies and upayas communication and uh, emphasizing, for example, if you ask people uh, if they come in when they see you, uh, they say, how have you done? Well, I've done fine. If you've done the practices, we told you, well, not really. <laughs> so even to, even to get that reinforcement or understanding from them of what they're actually doing, they say, oh, I had a bad month last month, but did you actually do the practices we recommended for you? Uh, no, I didn't happen to do them that particular month. See, so an ongoing relationship is important. And the Jyotishi, the Ayurvedic doctor can, or practitioner can see people more often perhaps, but even the Jyotishi has to see the client at least once a year, but even more often, uh, if there's a change of dashas, if there are buktis, if there's a uh, important transit going on, where are the eclipses going on this year, uh, you need to set up that long-term relationship with the client. And of course, it's also good for your business because the same person that you would have previously see only once, you may be seeing them quite a bit. And if you add Ayurveda and Jyotish together, you have an even better model for helping the person as well as for uh, reinforcing the practices and the teachings because we're hit by so many things uh, that uh, 
it's very important that there is someone that we can talk to to keep along that particular line. Hari Om. Hari Om. I love that so much, Vamadeva, the highlighting the importance of a continued relationship between a practitioner and a client. I, I firmly agree with you that that one and done approach to Ayurveda or Jyotish, it's, it's not sustainable in, in a healing way whatsoever. I just, have, please. Yeah I, yeah, I just want this to mention one more thing here that's come up, I, just to make sure, I don't know if we have time for it, but uh, the Jyotish and Ayurveda, you can call them sciences, but they are yogic sciences. And they are sciences that address the living and the transcendent human being. They are not mechanical sciences that can be reduced to a formula. Uh, I have to say this very clearly. In Jyotish, <clears throat> there are many techniques. They're very helpful for giving basic information, but never weigh a technique more than one third in your judgment of a chart because you have to look at the chart as a whole. And don't worry about mathematical precision. Nature is not mathematically precise. There's not a single moment when spring exactly begins. The year isn't exactly 360 days. The, the day is not exactly 24 hours. Uh, there are various changes, not only the procession of the, the equinoxes, there's the procession of the seasons, uh, there's the tilt of the earth on its axis. Uh, mathematical precision isn't there. And so when you want to go into the most subtle mathematical level, you can often miss uh, the obvious. Uh, so uh, you also have to remember that astrology and Ayurveda, also you could say an art or spiritual uh, vision, and giving people just precision in their lives is not necessarily what you need. You need to help them awaken an aspiration, a deeper change how they live, it's not just a question of giving them a certain gem at a certain time or telling them that uh, this is going to be good for this and that's going to be uh, bad uh, for that. So to move out of the mechanical mathematical model, and you have to know something about it. I see today astrologers going to third and fourth levels and fifth levels of dashas, which are not mathematically possible because uh, the birth time is not that specific. And even you go to the basic birth chart, the Vamsha changes less than 15 minutes. So if you can't guarantee that your uh, birth time was within five minutes, then the Navamsha itself is questionable. And uh, or say someone is born with the uh, Navamsha of say 10 degrees, uh, 20 minutes in the chart. Well, the Navamsha changes at 10 degrees. So that means if the, if the person was born one or two minutes earlier, the Navamsha would be different. So the first thing we do is look at the Navamsha positions in the Rashi using the Lagna in the birth chart. So there are various tools we use that way. But the point is that it's a matter of communication and understanding the wisdom of the Vedas, which includes planets and other factors, and not just simply getting caught in certain mathematics, uh, techniques, or removing the individual there and just say, oh, this planet, that planet. No, there's a real person behind the chart and that real person is unique. Planets are influences like heat and cold and you know, uh, dampness and dryness we have to adjust to, but to unwaken the real person is what we need to do. And then they will take karmic responsibility for the life and they will also honor the teachings and uh, put them into uh, practice. Adiós. Thank you, Vamadeva. Just one concluding question as we kind of bring it all together and look to the future. What do you think the future looks like for both modern professional practitioners of both Jyotish and Ayurveda? You know, what do you kind of foresee for the future of these sciences and their either individual or shared integration with Western society? Well, I will start with the Ayurveda. <clears throat> Ayurveda has tremendous potential in terms of wellness, in terms of right living, in terms of psychological uh, balance, 
And in terms of basic things, diet, herbs, exercise, lifestyle, main problem that Ayurveda has is it's not a legal system of medicine. So that restricts certain conditions they can treat and also restricts certain medicines they can use. And as the medical establishment is growing, it is now taking a little more, it's kind of, I think the pandemic has pushed them a little bit away from traditional medicine. I think it will come back. But for example, I noticed that when the pandemic started, if I put up a message on the social media, how Ayurveda can help with immunity, sometimes I get a question coming back to me. And I've also found that practitioners who were re recommending uh, certain medications and things that they found that they were being questioned by the medical establishment as to as if they can, should be allowed to do that anymore in this uh, condition. Uh, so there has been that problem uh, and then limiting the one-on-one -on -one, uh, connection. But I think overall Ayurveda has to do well because immunity is what we need. And Ayurveda is the best thing for establishing physical and psychological immunity. Now, Jyotish always does better when there's difficulties at a personal level. Uh, so we found that people who are doing individual practice uh, have done okay, uh, but they have to have a clientele for it. The main difficulty for the Jyotishis is to develop their clientele because it's a subject that's not so well known and it's also a subject, a lot of the Western astrology doesn't take that so much professional orientation, it becomes more of a, a secondary thing for uh, people. So it has a great potential. Uh, it also, mundane astrology is very helpful, <clears throat> but of course that's not profitable. We've seen all of that with the mundane astrology relative to the COVID and all of that. I wrote an article in 2009, people were talking about uh, 2012 because of the Mayan calendar as being a time of great change and transformation. After going through the planets and influences involved, mainly to the uh, yearly yuga chart for different countries, I wrote that 2020 would mark the beginning of what I call the new time of troubles for humanity. When 2019 came, I posted that again with some minor variations, but when 2020 came, uh, I was shocked to, to what extent that that had actually occurred, although a lot of it was visible astrologically. Uh, so in terms of the future of humanity, we are in a difficult uh, period, and a lot of these can be seen astrologically, which doesn't mean we can change them. Even this current uh, war conflict that we have uh, going on, I look at the annual, what we call the Yugadi chart, the Chaitra, Shukla, Pratipat, Numon, and Pisces. Last year, the United States, and this, this goes on until end of April this year, had Mars and Rahu in the seventh house with Scorpio rising and Ketu in Scorpio. Venus was in the sixth house in Aries. So you had an exchange between the sixth and the seventh lords with Mars and Rahu in the seventh house. And I said, this is dangerous for foreign policy, but it could be dangerous for health too, because the sixth lord goes both ways. When Afghanistan occurred, I thought, well, maybe this is it. But when Russia occurred, uh, right now, there's been a planetary war between Venus and Mars that's been ongoing for some weeks, which is extraordinarily rare. But Venus and Mars are also the first and seventh lord for the United States and also the rulers of Rahu and Ketu. So even at that level, Jochish has some help. I'm not giving predictions for the future. I'll look at that later. But we do have difficulties and technology. Technology is very difficult for people to live with all the time. Ayurveda gives you a lifestyle to help you use the technology in the right way. And Jyotish can also give us the vision of future humanity and understanding karma. Uh, so we are not overwhelmed by our technology. We're not ruled uh, by it. So they have important futures. As professions, uh, they have their difficulties because of lack of licensing or the fact that astrology is something esoteric. But at this stage, I think that Vedic astrology has a better professional reputation than the Western astrology uh, today uh, and has taken a more uh, professional model. I'm not saying you can't find benefit in the Western astrology, that's a different uh, 
uh, issue. But if we continue a professional vene uh, approach and also connect with the other Vedic sciences and develop these long-term plans of interaction with the client and different domains of life and how to address them, and some degree of specialization you may do as a Jyotishi, which may be medical astrology, it may be a financial relationship or whatever it is, it has a good future, but we need to continue to promote it and uh, share it and bring its reputation in. The yoga community has done a very good job doing that. I remember teaching Ayurveda and yoga Ayurveda and Jyotish into yoga communities in the 1980s and nobody had it. And I'm talking about places like Kripalu, uh, Yogaville, Ananda, and so many others. They knew about it, but they weren't really bringing those things in. Now they're bringing it in more. So developing the broader uh, community. The other thing we have today is a very large Indian diaspora in the United States, all these wonderful temples. So that community is also interested in Jyotish, although they may go to Indian uh, Jyotishis uh, first, but still that knowledge is coming out there. And uh, again, we develop it, it will definitely grow. And individually, again, perseverance is required and you cannot develop a life-sustaining job in Ayurveda or Jyotish overnight. So you often have to go through a transitional period, not only of study, but also maybe having some other related job or integration with other disciplines, herbs, massage, nutrition, chiropractic, there's specializations and conditions there, integrative medicine at various levels. It's important also to be innovative and communicative and bring these teachings together uh, over all. So I would say that's my view of the future. And also Jyotish is spreading globally. These same things you're seeing in the United States are happening in Brazil. I even wanna tell you a story about Russia. Uh, we started a Jyotish group in Russia some years ago. And uh, I haven't been there in recent years, but we had a national meeting of the people in the group a few years ago. And we had 1500 people coming. Uh, we did it for the United States, we had 200. Ukraine also has a lot of interest, Eastern Europe has a lot of interest in the Vedic astrology and the Vedic uh, teachings, the Krishna movements also uh, very uh, popular there, but it is a global uh, movement happening in various areas and so it will continue to spread. So I would just say, closing this issue is that it's been my experience that whoever really dedicates themselves to whether it's Ayurveda or Jyotish or yoga, that Ayurveda or Jyotish or yoga or all together even better will take care of you. Ariel. Ariel, such divine insight and vision for the future of these Vedic sciences. I just wanted to, from the bottom of my heart, Vamadeva, thank you for having this conversation and discussion with me on the integration of Jyotish Ayurveda and so much more. Any concluding remarks, sir? Well, first of all, I wanna thank you because with your questions and with your own dedication and practice, you brought together one of the best interviews that I've experienced, uh, particularly in this uh, field. So I'm uh, grateful to you uh, for that. And I also wanna mention that we do have a big Jyotish community in the United States, uh, whether it's uh, at the last Jyotish conference we had in uh, Arizona, we also have many Jyotish groups in the United States. We've started some organization years ago. They spread off in various ways. And we have many individuals who are outside of organizations. So we have to honor that community as a whole and the freedom it has and make sure to bring all these communities together, Ayurveda, Jyotish and so forth. But we must remember in the end that doing good Jyotish or good Ayurveda is not the end or the goal. It is the self-realization. It is the yoga Vedanta. It is the raising of consciousness. 
and bringing out all the unity of Vedic and what we say, adhyatmic disciplines, disciplines that aim at a deeper self-realization for all of humanity. And that way Ayurveda and Jyotish give a very practical foundation, but we must also honor the great gurus and the uh, uh, higher teachings that uh, uh, continue to pour out and uh, go to seek the summit, have a good foundation, but uh, remember the goal is always that, you know, aham brahmasmi or sarvam kalvidam brahman, the self is Brahman, everything is Brahman, I am Brahman, as a universal realization for the benefit of all, not as a personal achievement. So let us reclaim the whole scope of the Vedic knowledge and bringing Ayurveda and Jyotish together is a very important foundation uh, for doing that. Adiyam. Adiyam. I would just like to conclude with a quick mantra. Om Devi Soreshwari Bhagavati Gange Tribhuvana Tarini Tararasarange Shankara Morini Havini Rimale Mama Mati Rastam Thavapara Kamale Om Shanti 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 Om Shri Gurviyo Namaha Harihi Om Hari Om And one last point I would like to bring up The Ganga is the Milky Way Also Her child Kartikeya is the uh, son of Shiva and Parvati. He's also the presiding deity of the planet Mars. Please meditate upon the stars and the planets at night. That will take you into the deeper knowledge of Jyotish. I've been studying the sky for years. Uh, you can get a nice telescope, but make sure that when you're talking about one of these stars or planets, you've actually seen it and see it regularly in the sky. Shri Garubhyo Namaha Hari Om Tat Sat.